Okay, well, welcome everyone to pediatric teaching today. Today, I wanted to talk about fluid and electrolyte management in pediatrics. And as I just said before, some of the things I'll be talking about today might seem fairly basic. Some of them you will already know, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to cover many different things that uh, that are new or um, are really crucial to um, the management of, uh, of, uh, of mm -hmm. please, please mute your devices if you can. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, we'll make a start. Um, so this is what I wanted to cover today. I mean, as I said, some of the things are going to be quite basic, basic physiology, and then we'll get into more, I think, complex clinical issues that are really relevant. But I think to understand fluid and electrolyte management in children, you do need to have an understanding of fluid and electrolyte physiology. And, and uh, we'll talk a bit about the water compartments of the body. Uh, we'll talk a, a little about antidiuretic hormone uh, ADH, as is often uh, it's often called. We'll talk about the renin angiotensin system. We won't spend much time talking about basic pathophysiology or basic physiology because most of it comes when you most of most of it um, comes when you uh, uh, tackle clinical cases and clinical problems, and then you can understand the biological or the the phys physiological basis for it. We'll talk about how to calculate maintenance fluid replacement again something that you probably already know but to be able to calculate fluid replacement in dehydration you have to be able to calculate maintenance fluid replacement as well so we'll talk about both of those things and why we calculate maintenance fluid and uh, dehydration replacement fluid uh, as we do we'll talk about the composition of different intravenous fluids uh, and oral rehydration solution it's some it's um, Something we should all have some idea of is the composition of the different intravenous fluids that we use. It's not just good enough to say you're going to hang a bag of intravenous fluid. You really need to know what's what's in it. Uh, and so we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about some electrolyte abnormalities that we see really commonly in uh, in pediatrics and and uh, and uh, in uh, critically ill children in particular. And they are hyponatremia, so low serum sodium hypernatremia if the serum sodium is high and hypoglycemia or at least I'm going to talk about the glucose requirements in intravenous fluids oh, and, fluid replacement. And, and also hypokalemia so we'll talk about all of those things today so let's make a start on 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 this most of you know from uh, medical student days that you are there are two main compartments of water in the body there's the intracellular water and the extracellular water. That's where the, the water is contained. And there's more in the intracellular compartment than there is in the extracellular compartment. But the extracellular compartment is made up of the intravascular compartment, the, the blood volume, and the interstitial compartment, which is around the cells. And much of the water that can be mobilized can be mobilized from the extracellular compartment. And so when children get dehydrated, they usually get dehydrated in the in the um, extracellular compartment, but also in the, in the intravascular compartment. The, the total body water per kilogram, if you look at it, of, of course, an adult has more body water, but a baby and a child has more body water per kilogram. So that there's more, a greater proportion of a, a child's weight is, is actually in water. So in an adult, it's 600 mils per kilogram, whereas in a, a child, it's 700, and in a neonate, it's 800. So nearly 80% of the body weight is actually in water, and 70% and in a child. 70% of the body weight is in water. Most of the fluid, or more than half the fluid, is in the intracellular compartment. As I said, the inside the cells contains more water than outside the cells. Um, so it's about two thirds, one third. Two thirds of the um, body water is in is outside the cells, and one uh, is inside the cells, and one third of it is outside the cells. And and remember, I said the blood volume takes up; it's part of the extracellular fluid. The blood volume is about seventy mils 
per kilogram in an adult and and proportionately more in a in a neonate um, especially a preterm neonate so um, you need to have some idea of the these water compartments the body water compartments and you need some idea of how they change over time and it gives you also some idea of why uh, some to some extent newborn babies infants and young children are particularly vulnerable to dehydration now I wanted to this is a little complex but I wanted to touch on the um the the role of antidiuretic hormone because I'm sure most of you know the role of antidiuretic hormone it is to to retain water so um when uh under certain circumstances, if we are getting dehydrated, then the reason why we pass less urine is because antidiuretic hormone acts on the aquaporin receptors in the interstitium of the kidneys in the in the renal medulla and increases the absorption of water through the cells. So you pass less urine, you absorb more water into the um, into the interstitial fluid of the kidneys, and then that gets reabsorbed into the um uh into the uh, uh the, the the renal blood flow and back into the circulation and the and the the um circumstances under which you have high levels of antidiuretic hormone are most most uh physiologically if your blood pressure is low so if your blood pressure is low you have high adh levels and you'll retain more water therefore your blood pressure will improve and if you're plasma volume goes down for whatever reason if you have dehydration vomiting and diarrhea then you'll have high adh levels and you'll retain more water from the collecting duct of the kidney and that will get back into the uh, blood volume or if your osmolarity goes high so if your blood is too concentrated then with with a too high concentration of sodium and other electrolytes because mostly what you've lost is water, then antidiuretic hormone is the ideal hormone to correct that because all ADH does is to reabsorb more water from the collecting ducts of the, of the uh, nephrons back into the um, interstitium of the kidney and then into the bloodstream. So they're the, they're the reasons why we have antidiuretic hormone. And you can imagine under many different uh illness conditions whether you are, have sepsis and hypotension or whether you have gastroenteritis and vomiting and dehydration and you've lost plasma volume or or if your blood is very concentrated because of um exposure to heat or because of uh um uh, some profound diarrhea profuse diarrhea then then ADH will help save us. It helps save us because it increases the absorption of water and uh, maintains blood volume. But there are certain circumstances where in the past we needed antidiuretic hormones. So if, if a child had meningitis, then they're likely to be unconscious for a period of time and not drinking. So having ADH was a good thing. It meant that our kidneys would absorb more water and we'd pass less urine and therefore we'd maintain our hydration. And the same with pneumonia or sepsis, all of these conditions associated with high levels of antidiuretic hormone. And for, for the most part, it's a good thing. It means that if you've got pneumonia and you're not drinking very much for several days, then your body will not get as dehydrated because your kidneys won't pass as much urine. You'll be absorbing most of the water from your urine. So it's a good thing, but there are circumstances under which it can be a bad thing too, and we'll get onto those. I wanted to talk about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system as well, because it's, I think, to understand the physiology of, of water and fluid and electrolyte management, you need to understand a bit about ADH, and you need to understand a bit about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and and it's a little bit like adh but but this renin angiotensin aldosterone system does some different things so remember i said that adh just absorbs water that's all it does it doesn't absorb any electrolytes just water whereas the renin angiotensin aldosterone system acts on both water and um uh and sodium retention 
and also causes vasoconstriction. So it has some other properties, but the same certain sort of circumstances that activate your microphones if you can. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So um, the, sa the same uh, 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 circumstances, the illness circumstances that activate our ADH um, system to increase the production of ADH also activate the renin angiotensin system. So low blood pressure or low cardiac output means that there's poor kidney perfusion. So if you've got poor perfusion of blood to the kidneys, then your renin levels, you, you, the kidneys increase the secretion of renin. And then that gets from in the liver, gets active, activated on by angiotensinogen to produce angiotensin 1. You'll be familiar with some of these pathways. The reason I wanted to talk about the pathways is because there are drugs that act on each of these levels, and you need to know that. So renin is converted to angiotensin 1, and angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2, and that's by angiotensin converting enzyme. And so when we're using, using captopril or enalapril, they're, remember they're ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, and this is where they act. They act on the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And the reason why captopril, for example, gives you brings your blood pressure down is because angiotensin 2 is a potent, it's the most potent vasoconstrictor in the body, even more potent than adrenaline. So angiotensin, if you if you have a blocky, a block here because of captopril, it'll block your it'll block the effect the, the production of angiotensin 2 and therefore you won't have as much vasoconstriction but that's the drug that blocks it if if in the normal circumstances when you've got low blood pressure or low cardiac output your body produces more renin it produces therefore more angiotensin 2 that leads to vasoconstriction that increases blood flow and blood pressure and therefore increases kidney perfusion and decreases the urine output and decreases the glomerular filtration rate by the vasoconstrictive effects of angiotensin 2. It also acts on the adrenal glands to produce aldosterone, and aldosterone increases water retention and it increases sodium retention. So with these, this mechanism, you get both water retention, sodium retention, and vasoconstriction. So these are the adaptive mechanisms that we have whenever there's low blood pressure, low cardiac output, severe dehydration. Of course, there's also the catecholamine response where you have high levels of, of adrenaline circulating, so produced by the adrenal glands. There's a variety of different responses, but if you know about the body compartments, the body water compartments, about ADH and about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, then that'll help uh, uh, going forward. Now, a little bit more physiology. If I wanted to talk about how we calculate maintenance fluid rates, and these have been calculated a long time ago. the The amount of the amount of fluid, amount of water, the amount of sodium, the amount of potassium, and the amount of energy that a child of a normal weight of of any given weight or different weights require for their normal metabolism and daily activity. And it's been worked out over a long time that you can use this rule called the 150-20 rule to work this out, to work out the amount of water that a child will need. So I'm sure you're familiar with the 150-20 rule, just, but just to go through it, for the first 10 kilos, then a child will need 100 mils per kilogram per day. That's, uh, that's the maintenance fluids a child will need. For, for the next 10 kilos, the child won't need that much. So they'll only need 50 mils per kilo per day. So one litre, 1,000 mils for the first 10 kilos, plus 50 mils per kilo per day. And for the next 10 kilos and thereafter, then a child will only need an extra 20 mils per kilo per day. So it's 1,000 plus 500 being the next 10 kilos. So 1,500 plus 20 mils per kilo per day. And this maybe a little hard for people to work out if you haven't practiced it but i would encourage you to just try to practice it on on children of different weights and different ages 
um, and uh, and work out. Uh, it's it's quite easy once you've practiced it. Secondly, that the 150-20 rule translates quite well. This is mils per kilo per day. It translates quite well into the mils per kilogram per hour. And that's the 4 to one rule. So four mils per kilo per hour for the first 10 kilos, followed by two mils per kilo per hour for the next 10 kilos, and then one mil per kilo per hour for the for the last 10 kilos. So you can do some calculations both using the 150-20 rule and the 4 to one rule and realize that they're roughly equivalent. It's not quite the same, but it's roughly equivalent. Now, it's also been worked out over a long period of time, 50 years ago or more, just how much not just water, but how much sodium a child needed. So somewhere between two to four millimoles per kilogram per day. But if you're 10 to 20 kilos, it's one to two millimoles per kilogram per day. And above 20 kilos for adults, they don't need quite as much salt per kilogram of body weight. And it's a bit the same for potassium. You need a bit more per kilogram per day for the first 10 kilos and a bit less as you go on. The, the, the amount of energy a child needs is is also been well worked out again about 50 years ago in the 1950s at least and and um it's similar to the amount of water that a child needs it's roughly equivalent to the 150 20 rule so 100 kilocalories per kilogram per day for the first 10 kilos followed by an extra 50 kilo, uh, uh, kilocalories per kilogram per day for the next 10 kilos and then above 20 kilos an extra 20 kilocalories per kilogram per day. Now, these days, we often relate that to kilojoules rather than kilocalories, or cal we often call them calories, but it's actually kilocalories. And all you need to remember is that to convert from calories or kilocalories to kilojoules, from calories to joules, you multiply it by 4.18. So when we are, when we if we're thinking about the amount of um, uh, calories we might consume in a day, then you can multiply that by four to get the amount of joules that you um, would would typically need. Let's just go through the some simple calculations for um, different weights. So let's say the first one is a 17 year old girl. Now, uh, sorry, a 17 kilogram girl, a child who weighs 17 kilograms, she'll need 100 mils per kilo um, for the first 10 kilos. So that's 1,000 mils plus 50 mils per kilo for the next seven, isn't it? So 10 get to get up to seven, uh, 17. So that's 1,000, five times seven is 350. So 1,350 mils in, the, in, in a 24 hour period. Now, if you can divide that by 24 and get to 56 mils per hour. So that's their maintenance fluid that the child would need. A 35 kilogram male or boy will need 100 mils per kilo for the first 10 kilos, the same 50 mils per kilo for the next 10 kilos, and then 20 mils per kilo for the, the next 10 kilos, for the next 15 kilos, I should say, because beyond that, the 20 mils per kilo goes beyond that. So for 100 mils per kilo for the first 10, 50 for the next 10, and then you've got 15 left, that's 20 mils per kilo. So it's 100 plus 1500 plus, plus 300. So you get to 800, 1800 mils in, 20, in a 24 hour period or 75 mils per hour. So if you thought about it, it's not 100 mils per kilo for just a 35 kilo child, because then, then you'd be giving like 3,500 mils, isn't it? That's It's important that you know the 150-20 rule. Now, also, what's important about it, this maintenance fluid rate, this was, again, worked out in the 1950s. It's important to realise that maintenance fluid were only calculated to be used under normal circumstances. Now, most of us don't drink that much each day. Most of us, um, some people do, but most of us don't drink that much but under normal circumstances where you're active, then that's roughly about the amount of fluid that you need to pass urine that is isotonic, which means it's not very concentrated, it's not very dilute. Whereas most of us don't drink that much, and therefore we pass a more concentrated urine. Right? That, but the maintenance fluid would, would enable the kidneys to excrete a solute load that is all our urea and electrolytes and creatinine that we produce that needs to be excreted and it enables the body to to pass that urine 
in an in an isotonic way, not too concentrated, not too dilute. We probably should drink that much water per day, but we but but most of us don't do that. It's also to replace the insensible losses. And it's just, again, a concept you need to understand. What does insensible losses mean? Does anyone know what is insensible losses? They're simply the losses that are the water, the fluid losses that are very difficult to sense. All right. And so we can we can sense or measure e relatively easily the amount of water that's lost in urine, but we can't measure easily the amount of water that's lost through our skin, and we can't measure the amount of water that's lost through our breathing. Um, and we can't also measure easily the water, the amount of water that's lost in stool. But there's three sorts of insensible losses, and they are the water that's lost in skin through the lungs and the water in the stool. And that's just called insensible losses. And it's about one fifth of our maintenance fluid. So remember I said the 150-20 rule is the normal maintenance fluid for a normal child who's normally active, not a sick child, but a normal child who's normally active. But but the the insensible losses are about one fifth of that. So of all our all our maintenance fluid, insensible losses make up one fifth. And what that means is if you've got a child who's got severe anuria or oliguria, then, then, then the insensible losses are generally all they need. So you don't replace it with normal maintenance fluids or half maintenance fluids. They might only need one fifth of their maintenance fluids um, in a given day. The second, so that's an important concept, the concept of insensible losses. It's been worked out again uh, many years ago that it's around, the insensible losses are around about 300 to 400 mils per meter squared per day. But it's but an easier way to remember is that it's about one fifth of the maintenance fluid uh, requirements. That's one concept. The other one is, as, as I said, the conversion of mils per kilo per day to mils per kilo per hour. And it's simple, but you just need to know it and maybe practice it a few times. 100 mils per kilo per day, 150, 20 equals four to one, all right, mils per hour. Right, I wanted to get on to some uh, disease states now and talk about rehydration and how we calculate um, the amount of fluid required in a child who's dehydrated. And you can see this child here, and I know that you know the clinical features of severe dehydration, and this child certainly has it, doesn't he? He's got very sunken eyes. He's got a very, what we call a scaphoid abdomen, normally the abdomen is sort of distended and protuberant like this, but of course, it's this is really sunken, a very sunken abdomen. He looks really lethargic and floppy. And so this is a child who's got very severe dehydration. And you might imagine that is more than 10% dehydrated. So if for you to calculate the amount of fluid that such a child needs, you need to go through a process of working out what his normal maintenance fluid is, what his deficit is, is fluid deficit when you're that dehydrated, when you're more than 10% dehydrated. And that's based on the clinical signs that you see. You can, you can just look at this child and decide that he's got signs of severe dehydration, therefore he must be more than 10% dehydrated, therefore you can work out the percentage of the body water loss. I'll, I'll explain in a minute. But the three things, maintenance fluid, the deficit, and you need to add some some extra fluid for ongoing losses. Sometimes when children start to be rehydrated, their diarrhea and their vomiting settles down straight away, but often the diarrhea will continue. So if you don't add any more fluid for ongoing losses, then um, you can get behind, the child can get behind in their fluid. So these three things, maintenance, deficit, and ongoing losses is very important. Of course, in a child who has shock, if they've got cold, clammy skin, if they've got weak pulses, if they've got very prolonged capillary return, and if their blood pressure is low, then they need their shock corrected first, and then they need um, this calculation to be done, the maintenance, the deficit, and the ongoing losses. And you can decide in a child like this with severe dehydration that you would replace the deficit over a certain number of hours. It could be over 
eight or 12 hours. Some people replace over 24. I usually replace fluid over 20, uh, over 12 hours because I think that in, in 12 hours time, you want to come back and be monitoring the child and seeing whether or not the child's gaining weight and their signs of dehydration are resolved. If you wait for 24 hours, then it's quite a long time for a child to be severely dehydrated. And if you've got somehow got the calculations not quite right, then you need to be reassessing more regularly than every 24 hours. So let's just take this example. This was a 14 month old boy who had three days of vomiting and diarrhea. He came in like this. He was lethargic. He had sunken eyes. He had poor skin turkey. You can see that the, the skin pinch goes back very slowly and he had very cold limbs. His weight was 9.2 kilograms. So you would, you would say that this boy is 10% or more dehydrated. You can see how lethargic he is. He's got sunken eyes. He's floppy. He's got a very poor skin pinch. You already know he's got um, cold limbs. So you would assess that he's got 10% or more dehydrated. So in a child who's nine kilos, his deficit is going to be 10% of that nine kilos. So it's going to be 900 mils. That's his deficit. Right? And if you were to decide that you would replace that over 12 hours, then that's 900 divided by 12. So that's 75 mils an hour. But remember, I said that's not all. There's the deficit, there's the maintenance, and there's the ongoing losses. So his maintenance is 9.2 kilos times 100, isn't it? 100 mils per kilo for the first 10 kilos. So that's an extra 920 mils. And if you were to replace that, remember that that's maintenance over a 24-hour period. So if you were to replace that, that over the next 24 hours, then he should get 38 mils per hour for, for the period of rehydration. All right. So we're all we're adding these up, maintenance plus deficit plus ongoing losses. And I usually ask the parents how many diarrheal stools have they had in the last 12 hours? It's hard to remember back some days ago, but if you just ask them about the last 12 hours, usually they know. And so this, this boy who's under two years of age, for every diarrheal stool, you would add an extra 50 mils. So that's another 200 mils, all right, over 12 hours. So that's that's um, an extra 17 mils an hour. So you can add this up, the, the, the deficit plus the, his normal maintenance plus extra for ongoing losses. So this boy's um, fluid requirements for the next 12 hours would be 130 mils per hour. And so if you do it like that, you can really understand, I think, the amount of fluid that a child needs. It, it's, um, it's useful to go through that exercise. If you look it up in the standard treatment book or the WHO um, pocketbook of hospital care for children, you'll come to the same conclusion, 130 mils per hour for 12 hours. But it's useful to know the, the, the derivation of that and to know, yeah, to know where that came from so you can, you can do it yourself. It also means it's just an estimate, don't forget. And, and when you um, reassess this child, even in a few hours' time, you need to know that his shock is starting to resolve and he start, his clinical signs are beginning to resolve. And certainly when you reassess the child in six hours' time, you want to be able to see that the child's gaining weight and they've their, their, um, their clinical signs of dehydration are starting to resolve. And if, if they're not, if they've had more diarrhea or that for some reason that it's not enough, then you need to revise your estimates because it might be he's not 10% dehydrated, it might be he's 15% dehydrated or 12% or, or and you've underestimated the, the, the amount of um, uh, deficit and his, and uh, yeah. On the other hand, you might have overestimated. So that's, that's why I say it's an estimate that you need to reassess all the time and decide whether a bit more or a bit less or, or just the, the, the right amount is being given. Too, too often I've seen children that some sort of, uh, they come in, they've got de dehydration, severe dehydration, they just could put on maintenance fluids. And then 24 hours later, it's no surprise that they are still dehydrated because no one went through this calculation. So I'd encourage you to do this sort of calculation, not just to put a child on maintenance fluids. Uh, I, most of, uh, we've talked more, more about severe dehydration, but of course for mild or moderate dehydration, then the best 
sorts of fluid is not intravenous fluid at all, is it? If the best sorts of fluid is is oral rehydration solution and and breast milk. So for children with mild or moderate dehydration, then ORS is very useful. And just like I've, I'm, I'll show you shortly the the composition of intravenous fluids. I want you to also have an understanding of the composition of the electrolyte composition of oral rehydration solution. It's very, it is important because the reason why RS works is the is the electrolyte composition, and I'll explain. But it's got seventy five millimoles of sodium per liter, and seventy five millimoles of glucose per liter. It's got um, uh, 20 millimoles of potassium, uh, 60 of chloride, and 30 of bicarb. And it has an osmolarity of 245. There used to be a WHO solution that had so the sodium was 90 millimoles, but the, it was thought that that caused more problems. So this is low osmolarity ORS, which is mostly what we use these days, low osmolarity ORS. Certainly, it was considered that it was better for, there were some studies showing it was better for children with severe malnutrition to be replacing with this, uh, this low osmolarity ORS. The reason why it's such a, a, a good fluid is because, the, is because of the balance of the glucose and the sodium content. And, and it was worked out again in the, about the 1970s in Bangladesh that every time there's there's a there's a um, a transporter mechanism in the mucosa of the lining of the gastrointestinal tract of the small intestine that is a glucose sodium transporter and for every molecule of glucose that's absorbed then there's one molecule of sodium also absorbed and then with that comes water uh, with that water must be absorbed as well and and the reason why it's it's a good, it's a good, the reason why it's a, a very good fluid and uh, can you ask can you um mute your your device please yeah the reason why rs is a good fluid is because it has a very balanced glucose and sodium content and there are some children who um for example might uh in years gone by we saw lots of children with diarrhea who were given like uh, energy drinks like lucozade or some sort of high high glucose energy drink or even even just uh, sprite that um, some uh, parents would give their children sprite or some other form of lemonade and that is not a good f uh, fluid for children with diarrhea because it has too much glucose in it and uh, ors needs some glucose but if it has too much then that can lead that can lead to worsening of the diarrhea. Why? Because instead of the glucose being absorbed, the glucose acts as what's called an osmotic agent. And it sits in the, in the small intestine and draws out more water. So the diarrhea becomes worse. So you, get the, you then get an osmotic diarrhea and, uh, and children can get very sick from that. So ORS is a really well worked out solution. Uh, and especially, as I said, the, the content of glucose uh, compared to the content of sodium. That's, what, that's what's uh, brilliant about it. We, we know that if you continue to breastfeed, then the duration of diarrhea is less. And so when you think about the sort of fluid for children with, with mild or moderate diarrhea, then the two fluids are ORS and milk feeds. It reduces the risk of sepsis. It reduces the risk of peristalsis, uh, of, of, uh, of, of diarrhea and, and uh, pr provides some protection for the gut, yeah, it re reduces the duration of diarrhea. So important to continue breastfeeding if you, if you can. Now, I said we'd talk a bit about the composition of intravenous fluids because it's useful to know this, I think, that um, we use a lot of different sorts of intravenous fluids and there's more than this, but I just wanted to highlight a few and say why some are, um, are more suitable than others, right? And so years ago, a fluid that was commonly used in pediatrics in countries all throughout the world was this fluid called um, one-fifth normal saline and 4.3% dextrose. That was commonly used. Now, that didn't turn out to be a very good fluid. In fact, it was quite, it, it's quite a dangerous fluid for, for children who are very sick, and especially those that have high ADH levels. 
And the reason it's dangerous is because it doesn't have very much sodium in it. Now, normally the sodium in our plasma is 135 to 145, but this fluid, 4.3% dextrose and one fifth normal saline, only has 31 millimoles of sodium in it. And what it led to was many children becoming hyponatremic. Their sodium level would be quite low. And it led to many children. We used to see many children that presented with um, severe hyponatremia and seizures and sometimes cerebral edema. Sometimes they would get brain swelling because their sodium level would drop so low. And I'll explain that in a, in a, in a moment. But that's a fluid that we should not use these days and, unless you really have to and this is some circumstances when you really have to it's much much better to to not use that fluid there are some other fluids and i i think that hartman solution is hartman solution is also sometimes called ringer's lactate solution and it's a it's it's a much more what we call physiological or a balanced salt solution so it contains 130 millimoles of sodium so very similar to plasma 5.4 millimoles of potassium, again, similar to plasma. It's, a, it's got 112 millimoles of chloride, very similar to plasma. And it has some glucose in it, or you can get a Hartman solution that has glucose in it. So 5% dextrose with Hartman solution is the best fluid, I'd say. Um, and has some calcium in it, and it has some lactate in it. Now, lactate, I'll explain what that does in a moment. But the other fluids that we sometimes use, one being normal saline, that's got 100 to 100, uh, sorry, 150 to 154 millimoles of sodium, so much more than plasma, and 154 millimoles of chloride, and which is a lot more than in in plasma. And that's um, normal saline is a problem because mostly because of the high chloride levels. And when you're giving a patient a lot of chloride, chloride is like an acid and acidic ion, isn't it? It's a negatively charged ion that um, means that the pH of normal saline is often quite low, like it's around about a pH of three or four. So unlike a balanced salt solution like Hartman's solution, which is a pH of around about six or seven, so much closer to the normal pH in the body, normal saline has a very low pH. And so if you've got a child who's got a, a, an acidosis and you give them lots of normal saline, then their acidosis may continue rather than resolving. And you might think the child's still dehydrated because their acidosis doesn't correct. Or you might wonder why they've got such severe tachypnea, but it's because of their acidosis rather than their dehydration or not because they've got pneumonia. If you can, please mute your devices so we can hear. So uh, I think the main things I would want you to know are that um, some fluids you shouldn't use. So don't use this one, 4.3% dextrose and one fifth normal saline. If you can use Hartman's solution, there's another one that's very similar to Hartman's solution called Plasmalite, which is also a very good solution. It's like Hartman's solution. Ideally, don't use normal saline if you've got Hartman solution, but remember that some Hartman solutions doesn't have glucose in it. So you need to add glucose or you need to get the, the Hartman solution or the ringer's lactate that actually does have Hartman solution in it. That does have glucose in it, I should say. I, I just, I wanted to touch on this, uh, this discovery. And this was, um, this is Alexis Hartman. He was a biochemist and a pediatrician in the US in the 1930s, in the early 1930s. And he wanted, Alexis Hartman wanted to make the ideal fluid for children with diarrhea. And he made Hartman's solution. It's also, as I said, caused Ringer's lactate. That was um, a, a similar solution made around about the same, a bit before, but Alexis Hartman, he designed this fluid called Hartman's solution. And the reason why it's a bit better than the traditional Ringer's lactate or Ringer's solution is because Alexis Hartman added lactate to it. Now, remember I said that that lactate, uh, Hartman solution has 27 millimoles of lactate in it. And you might wonder what this lactate's for. But for years, 
people wondered how they could make a solution that wasn't as acidic as normal saline. So you think, as I said, normal saline has 150 millimoles of chloride in it, so it's a very acidic solution. And people thought about adding bicarbonate to the, the solution, but the problem with adding bicarbonate is it, 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 it precipitates in intravenous um, uh, uh, lines and, and in bottles. It'll just precipitate. And so instead of giving bicarbonate that's useful in the body, it'll precipitate in the, in the line, block the lines up. So nobody knew how to, to address this until Alexis Hartman came along and he added lactate to Ringer's solution, this thing called Ringer's solution, and therefore made Ringer's lactate or Hartman's solution. And the reason why it's clever is because lactate, if you've got a well-functioning liver, then your liver converts lactate into bicarbonate. So you don't, you don't have to worry that the, the, um, the, the lactate or the, the bicarbonate will precipitate in the intravenous um, bottle or in the intravenous lines, the, the intravenous tubing, because when it, it it's only when it gets into the blood and into the liver that it gets converted to to um, uh, to bicarbonate. So th in that way, um, Alexis Hartman was able to make a solution that was much more physiological. It made it was closer to our normal plasma, and I think that was forgotten for many many years um, while we were using. 4.3% dextrose and one-fifth normal saline. For many years, decades, in fact, pediatricians were using this, this other solution. And then we started seeing lots of children getting severely unwell with hyponatremia, and we went back to Hartman's solution. In many ways, the, the surgeons have used Hartman's solution for a long time, haven't they? Uh, surgeons, anaesthetists, and, but now pediatricians should be starting to use this Hartman's solution again and understanding what it's all about. Okay, so then what, what volume of maintenance fluid do we use in a child who's unwell? I said what volume is required for children who are well, if they're well and normal, normally metabolizing. Well, the problem is that if you give the 4 2 1 rule or the 150 20 rule, if you apply that to a very sick child, then often they'll be overhydrated. They'll, um, they'll develop edema, particularly periorbital edema, sometimes limb edema, and sometimes edema of their lung. If you give them their normal maintenance fluid with the 150-20 rule. In fact, we found that about a quarter of all children with meningitis, if they, they would develop facial edema, if given 100% of their normal maintenance fluid, and they and those that got edema did quite badly. So the main thing is to avoid overhydration in very sick children. So you should start with two thirds or even one half of their maintenance fluid. In a child with meningitis, unless they are dehydrated, then I always start with half maintenance. If you have to give, if you have to give intravenous fluid. Remember, enteral feeding is better, and most sick children can be enterally fed, either orally or via nasogastric tube. But if you have to give intravenous fluids for a period of time, for a day or two, then start with, if they don't have dehydration, start with two thirds or even one half. If, they've, if they're if they severely unwell and they're not dehydrated, then start with one half. Now, when you're calculating, when you're thinking about maintenance fluid and what to give a child who's very unwell, also remember that the more drugs they're on, the more fluid they're getting. And we see a lot of children that need that that no matter what the doctors have written up in terms of their maintenance fluid, if they've written up a lot of drugs too, then often that adds another fifty percent to the total fluid intake the child has. And that can lead, if you think about it, if you gave a hundred percent of their normal maintenance fluid and you give an extra 50 percent on top of that with drug dilutions and those sorts of things then you can get up to 150 percent of their maintenance fluid and it's no wonder that many sick children get edematous that they have fluid overload because they've got high antidiuretic hormone levels they're hanging on to water and then the doctors come along and give them lots of intravenous fluid and then they get lots of intravenous fluid with their drug dilutions and they might get some oral fluid as well and they might get a blood transfusion so a whole lot of reasons why they we often give too much fluid to children so be very careful about overhydration in patients 
I'm just going to touch on some electrolyte derangements now. And just to say that, that they're very common in pediatrics, more common in pediatrics than adult medicine, I think. Uh, and there's reasons for that. But these are some studies that show how common they are. These are all in children. And these are children who've got different diseases. So septicemia, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, and meningitis. And some of the studies were done in Europe and some were done in Papua New Guinea. And you can see that a very high proportion of children in many of these studies had hyponatremia when they presented. They had low serum sodium. And, and many, many, close to 20% of children with pneumonia and meningitis had severe hyponatremia, like a serum sodium less than 130. And that that is that is actually quite dangerous for children. So we one should be checking the serum sodium in children when they present with these severe illnesses. And two, we need to be careful about the intravenous fluid we give children, the volume we give, the composition of the fluid, etc. The reason why it's important is because if you've got hyponatremia, then your serum osmolarity will be very low. I won't go through this in detail, but to calculate the serum osmolarity, you double the sodium, add the potassium twice, which is a small number usually, add the glucose and add the urea. And that's, your, that's the child's serum osmolarity. But the, the dominant the dominant electrolyte, of course, is the sodium because that's the biggest number, 140 millimoles usually, whereas the potassium is only four, isn't it? Uh, three and a half or four. So that's a small number. So the, the amount of sodium you're, that... Um, what happens to your serum sodium really matters to your serum osmolarity. And that's the serum osmolarity that dictates where the fluid, where the water moves into cells or out of cells. And so if your serum osmolarity rises, then water moves out of cells to try to maintain the normal serum osmolarity in your blood. And if your serum osmolarity falls because of hyponatremia, then water will move into cells to, again, equalize the, the serum osmolarity between the intracellular and extracellular fluid compartments. So it's the, if, if a child's got severe hyponatremia, then water will move into cells. And the worrying cells are the brain cells. If a child's got hypernatremia, their serum sodium is very high, then water will move out of cells. And I'll explain why both things are dangerous. Both, both changes are quite dangerous. Hyponatremia is very common, as I said, in severe childhood illnesses, in meningitis, in pneumonia, post-operative cases, and in sepsis. So the questions we need to ask when we see a child with hyponatremia is, is the child normally hydrated or dehydrated or overhydrated? And is the, sodium, is the hyponatremia due to sodium loss or water excess? Right? And usually on the history and the examination, you can work that out because there'll be a history of vomiting or there'll be clinical signs of dehydration or there'll be, there may be a history of, of the type of um, uh, intake the child's had in terms of water and salt, et cetera. And the question you need to ask is, if it's sodium loss, if the hyponatremia is due to sodium loss, where is it being lost? Is it being lost through vomiting or is it being lost through diarrhea, et cetera? And if it's water excess, is it natural, as in just high ADH levels, the child's in somewhat water retention, or is it iatrogenic? Is it a, some sort of a uh, hospital acquired problem, as in they're, they're on the wrong fluid or the wrong volume of fluid. So these questions, if you see a child with severe hyponatremia, like I said, 20% of children with meningitis and pneumonia have severe hyponatremia. So it's a very common problem and we need to be experts in its management. And the reason, as I said, why hyponatremia occurs is because of antidiuretic hormone levels, which we all have all the time but normally it's suppressed and it increases if you if you become unwell. So with meningitis or pneumonia or bronchiolitis. And it can lead to hyponatremia. And most of these children aren't dehydrated. They're often normally hydrated, but they have a very concentrated urine. They'll put out very little urine. The main implication of this is not to give too much IV fluids. And that's why I say half to two thirds is about right. 
and also to give don't give a hypotonic fluid don't give 4.3 percent dextrose and one-fifth normal saline you should give something that's a bit more like Hartman's solution or you should give enteral feeding with nasogastric breast milk or something like that that's it's better to give enteral feeding or a balanced salt solution than it is to give one-fifth normal saline this is a child who had a a serum sodium that was very low, 116, I think it was. And um, and this is what can happen. This is a child who had severe, some of you will be familiar with how to read CT scans. And this is severe cerebral edema related to, caused by severe hyponatremia. Remember I said, if you if your serum sodium is low, then water will move into cells. And uh, that will cause sw swelling of cells, including the, um, uh, the brain cells. We'll talk about hypernatremia now. And it's, it's the opposite in many ways. It's where you're losing more water than salt. So um, with hyponatremia, you're uh, either receiving too much water or losing too much salt. And with hypernatremia, you're losing more water than you are losing salt. Right? So it's not an isotonic dehydration. It's a hyper hypernatremic dehydration. So this can occur often with gastroenteritis, and it can also occur when you've got an osmotic diarrhea. And remember I said, if a child who gets, gets um, rehydrated at home using Sprite or some other lemonade, then they're likely to get osmotic diarrhea and they may have hyper, hypernatremia, right? It also commonly occurs in, in some countries, uh, Bangladesh, India particularly, where if a breastfeeding mother is also dehydrated, then sometimes their infant can get, if they get a virus infection or something, can get um, a severe hypernatremic dehydration. Um, that that is uh, uh, that's why mothers should drink lots of water. They should maintain their hydration when they're when they're breastfeeding. There's a few other reasons why hypernatremia may occur, but they're um, rare. Mostly, it's from uh, dehydration in gastroenteritis. Sometimes it can be um, that the child is um, receiving a, a rehydration solution that has too much sodium in it. So, um, for example, if they if if there's RS being made up with too much salt in it, or even sometimes there's there's a, a deliberate salt poisoning of uh, of children that leads to hyponatremia and and severe um, uh, dehydration, often vomiting and dehydration. When, when a child has hypernatremic dehydration, their, their skin has a particular feel to it. And it is like, it feels what we call doughy. It's like when you bake bread and it feels just like dough. Um, that's what the skin of the abdomen feels like. They have a very parched tongue there. Um, they, but, but despite that, the very doughy skin, you can see this child, this, this neonate had a sodium of 175. And you can see how sunken his fontanelle is even his uh, sutures are sunken in between his sutures. This is severe hypernatremic dehydration. Sometimes they'll have a normal blood pressure. And that's because when you've got hypernatremic dehydration, then the intravascular volume, the, the blood volume is usually maintained better than the extracellular volume. Or most of the fluid loss comes from the extra, uh, the interstitial fluid rather than the rather than the um, uh, intracellular fluid or the blood volume. These children often, have, they seem quite neurologically impaired and usually or often they get um, diagnosed with clinical meningitis. They are lethargic, they're irritable, they're, um, they may have other neurological signs, hyperreflexia or seizures, a reduced Glasgow coma score. But unlike children with meningitis or raised intracranial pressure, they'll have a very sunken fontanelle. And so that can be a bit of a clue. But but if you see a child who's had severe dehydration or vomiting and uh, diarrhea, and they've got neurological signs, then think that they might have hyponatremic dehydration. This is the um, uh, the scan of a child with severe hyponatremic dehydration, and you might not be able to um, interpret this too much, but this shows severe ischemic infarction of the brain and hemorrhage and if you've got severe hyponatremic dehydration then that's often what we see is children who have um, severe um, ischemic or 
ischemic areas within their brain are infarction. So hyponatremic dehydration can lead to cerebral edema. Hypernatremic dehydration can lead to strokes and, and uh, uh, cerebral hemorrhage. So both of them are quite dangerous if they go to the extremes. If you've got a child with hypernatremic dehydration, you usually want to correct it rather slowly, not, not so quickly. If you correct it too quickly, then the fluid can move rapidly the other way and it can lead to cerebral edema. So you usually correct the hypernatremia over 48 to 72 hours. And the sodium should not fall any faster than half a millimole per litre per hour. So over a 24-hour period, you'd hope that the sodium fell by 12 millimoles over 24 hours. And, and a good solution to use in this circumstance is Hartman's solution. It will bring down the sodium, but not too fast. If you don't have that, then you have to use normal saline. That's okay too, but it's not quite as good as Hartman's solution. Remember, Hartman's solution needs to have glucose in it as well, as does normal saline in, in any child. I was going to talk about the glucose content of intravenous fluids because if we're giving, for example, normal saline or just plain Hartman solution to any child, then that's not enough. All sick children, especially infants, need some source of glucose. If you're an adult, you can usually get by without a source of glucose because you've got glycogen storage stores in your liver. You can break down um, uh, your glucose stores, but infants particularly and neonates, they need a source of glucose. And so um, other children with malnutrition or liver disease or prolonged starvation, they really need a source of glucose and they'll get hypoglycemic if they, if they don't. Um, they'll get hypoglycemic and often ketotic and acidotic if you don't give them enough glucose. So the question is how to make up a glucose or a dextrose solution. Um, I'll go through this in a bit slowly because you need to... You need to be able to know how to make up, say, a 5% dextrose solution or a 10% dextrose solution. You may or may not have IV fluids that can contain this. But to, to make up a 5% a glucose or dextrose solution, then, then you need to know what 5% means. 5% means 5 grams of glucose per deciliter or per 100 mils. So if you think about 5 per 100 five grams of glucose per 100 mils of fluid. Right? That's what 5% 5 5 dextrose is. So if you add 50 grams of dextrose to 100 mils of, uh, uh, make that up to 100, uh, sorry, 50 grams of dextrose to one litre of fluid, then that's your 5%, right? Five grams per 100 mils or 50 grams per litre, okay? Now, the question is how to make that up. And we often use this uh, solution called 50% dextrose, right? which we should never infuse as an infusion, but you can use it to make up 5% dextrose. Now, remember, 50% dextrose is 50 grams per 100 mils. So if you want to make up 50, 50 grams, you need to be adding 100 mils to make it up to one litre. And so the way to do that is add 100 mils of 50% dextrose. Remember, that's got 50 grams of dextrose into 900 mils of Hartman solution. Right? So you have to take out 100 mils of Hartman solution, add the 100 mils of 50% dextrose. Then you've got Hartman solution with 5% glucose. The same with normal saline. If you were to, if you were to make up um, normal saline and 5% dextrose, you'd, you'd take out 100 mils from the normal saline, uh, one liter of normal saline and add 50 mils, uh, sorry, 100 mils of 50% dextrose to it. Right. If you want to do it in a burette, then it's the same thing. You have to make a dilution of one in 10 or a one plus nine dilution, meaning, meaning 10. So adding 10 mils of 50% dextrose to 90 mils in a burette will give you a ratio one to nine dextrose to IV fluids, and that's a 5% solution. So one plus nine is 10. So you've got your 100 mils there. I hope that makes sense. You can do it um, either into a one litre bag or into a burette, but you need to know how to do it.
the, the, I've said there the dangers of 50% glucose, and I'm sure you know, but if you give like infusions of 50% glucose, then that can cause um, uh, thrombophlebitis, um, but it can also cause <clears throat> severe hyperglycemia. So we never use it as an infusion, except, except in very rare circumstances when you've got a central line in and you can give like one mil per kilo of 50% glucose in a child who's got severe hypoglycemia. But other than that, you never give it as a continuous infusion. Um, use it to make up um, uh, dextrose saline or dextrose Hartman solutions. Ideally, you'd get you'd be able to pur purchase Hartman solution with 5% dextrose. That would be the ideal fluid. Right. Now, just to finish off, I'm going to talk a bit about hypokalemia because it's very common. We'll, we will talk about this at a later date, but I wanted to talk about how to correct hypokalemia and how to understand the calculations. All right. Now, hypokalemia occurs in, we see it a lot in diarrhea, like in children with severe diarrhea, they may lose um, uh, potassium and become very hypotonic and weak and floppy. I'm sure you've seen children with that Sometimes it's called hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Sometimes it's just a complication of severe gastroenteritis and diarrhea. There, there is a differential diagnosis. So not all children with severe hypokalemia have um, it related to their diarrhea. And we also see severe hypokalemia, low, very low serum potassium in children who've got renal tubular acidosis. We'll, we'll talk about kidney disease at another date, I think. But... But just remember, if the serum potassium, you remember the normal is 3.5 to 5. If it's less than 2 millimoles per litre, then it'll be very hard to correct hypokalemia in that circumstance with oral potassium. If it's 2.5 or 3, then sometimes giving oral potassium will be enough. But if it's less than 2 and you've got a child who's hypotonic and weak and floppy, then you need to give generally give intravenous potassium. The problem is most people aren't familiar with how to make up a potassium solution. And I want to try to give you some basic principles of how to do it. And the first principle is you need to understand what, how much is in a gram of potassium chloride. You know, when we've got a vial of potassium chloride, that's one gram of potassium chloride. Sometimes there are two gram vials, but let's talk about a one gram vial. That has 13 millimoles, 13.4 millimoles of potassium in it. Right? The second principle is that you can safely give one millimole per kilogram of potassium chloride over four hours or point, a quarter of a millimole per kilogram per hour maximum. That's the maximum you should give. So if you put one gram of, if you put in a liter of fluid, and run it at the normal maintenance fluid rates, like four mils per kilo per hour. If you put two grams in, then your, I'll just move this if I can. Maybe can't. If you put two grams of potassium chloride into a, a liter of fluid, um, then you're putting in 26.8 millimoles, right? And if you run it at four mils per kilo per hour, then you'll be running it at 0.11 millimoles per kilogram per hour. And remember, we said the safe amount is 0.25 millimoles per kilogram per hour. So that's well within the safe limit, right? So if you put two grams in a litre, that's within the safe limit. The problem is for most children, that won't, if that with severe hypokalemia, that won't bring their potassium up enough. And if you put in three grams of potassium chloride, then you'll get it up to then you'll be giving 40 milli, millimoles per litre. And you'll be giving, if you run it at four mils per kilo per hour, you'll be running it at 0.16 millimoles per kilogram per hour, which is again within the safe level. So that's okay too. So three grams in one litre would be safe. And for most children, that will be enough. For most and then children, just what doctor lagi. For, for most children, that will be... Uh, 
Please um, please um, mute your device if you can. Thank you. Um, as I say, for most children, that will be enough. Uh, 0.16 millimole per kilogram per hour, three grams of KCL put into a litre of fluid. You, The maximum you can put into a one litre bag, this is important, the maximum you can put in is four grams of KCL. You never put in more than that because it will cause um, significant thrombophlebitis of the veins, inflammation of the veins, and it, it could be very dangerous if it extravasates. So you can put in two grams, three grams, or four grams safely, but not more than that. If you were to put in four grams of KCL into a one liter bag, remember you can't run it more than four mils per kilo per hour. So you need to have an infusion pump to run it if you're gonna run a, a potassium infusion like this. But if you're running it at four mils per kilo per hour, so normal maintenance fluid for a, a child under 10 kilos, remember this is for children under 10 kilos, then you'll be giving 0.21 millimoles per kilogram per hour, again, within the safe limit of 0.25 millimoles per kilogram per hour. I, I think generally that, that three grams of KCL in a litre is a safe amount. And usually it's what is required to uh, correct severe hypokalemia. All right? But I, I guess what I'm trying to give is a, the basic principles of how you know how much potassium you're adding to a, to a, um, uh, to, to a child's fluid. And um, remember that you, if you're giving more than four mils per kilo per hour, then you can't, you can't put in this much. All right? But it's only if you're giving normal, the normal maintenance fluid, then you can put in um, two, three, or four grams quite safely. All right? um, I hope that makes sense to you. Three grams is okay, especially in a child who's got a potassium level less than two millimoles. Definitely, I, would, I wouldn't put in any less than three grams per litre. Because uh, you you if you do that you won't correct the the um, uh, this the the hypokalemia, right? Now the last thing I want to say today is about how to monitor children on IV fluids, and this is something that you should just incorporate into your ward round every day for every child who's on IV fluids. First of all, you should check for edema. That is, check for see if the child's got puffy eyes or whether they've got swelling of their lower limbs and if they have then you should stop their fl uh, IV fluids or you should you should s slow the IV fluid down the edema is very common especially the earliest signs are puffy uh, eyes um, and sometimes it's uh, it's unfortunate but we see children they've been on IV fluids for 48 hours and they can hardly open their eyelids and it's because they they've become edematous in the face because they've they've received too much fluid because people gave too much fluid because they didn't calculate their, their TFI or the total fluid intake uh, correctly. You should also check for signs of dehydration every day. So check for signs of edema and signs of dehydration every day in a child on IV fluids. So, so you know the signs of dehydration. I won't go through them again, but they can be easily checked in a ward round at the bedside. You feel their hands to feel if their hands are warm or cold. You feel the pulse, the radial pulse see if they're tachycardic or measure their blood pressure or if they've got a low pulse volume. And then ideally you should weigh the child every day who's on IV fluids. And if, if a child's gained more than 5% of their body weight over 24 hours, then probably they've, they're getting fluid overloaded. It's not because they've gained nutrition. It's probably because they're fluid overloaded. And, and, and you should check at least every day or every second day, you should check their serum sodium, check their electrolytes. Because if a child's, especially if a child's got borderline serum sodium to begin with, because if the sodium's less than 130 or more than 150 then, or it's or it's changed by more than five millimoles, that's, that's a very important finding. And you need to stop and assess the cause and correct the hyponatremia or hypernatremia before it gets to the point that I showed you before with those, those uh, CT scans. So, that's all I wanted to say today about IV fluids. I'm sure we'll talk more about um, fluid management as we go along with different topics, but I hope that is useful to you. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might might have about, um, about this topic. Um, thanks, everyone.